Africa Prime, brought to you by Jamison Select Reserve. Good evening and welcome to Africa Prime, the show where we look at issues that affect uh, economic development in Africa and also assess what Africa ought to be doing to try to take advantage of uh, the opportunities that have been brought about by globalization. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Rama Sitanen. He is a former Deputy Prime Minister of Mauritius. He's also a former Finance Minister of Mauritius. He's been around the globe. He's also worked for the World Bank. He's worked for the IMF. And uh, tonight, he joins us to share his views on what he has seen in terms of what ought to make Africa tick. Dr. Rama Sitanen, thank you for coming and welcome. What brings you to South Africa? Two reasons, principally. First, I've been invited as a guest speaker on a tax conference uh, basically on investing uh, in Africa. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And how can African countries meet these challenges and take advantage of these opportunities? And second, I'm currently the chairman and director of one of the leading management companies uh, in Mauritius that operates in the global business. So I've come to South Africa to promote uh, Mauritius as a tested, trusted uh, jurisdiction for global business in Cape Town and in Johannesburg. Now, in terms of uh, trying to get Mauritius and Africa trading with each other, you know, one of the statistics that's always brought up is the fact that Africa does not trade with itself. Would you say, from the talk that you gave, there are enough examples to say this is beginning to happen now? It's improving, but from a very low base. If we make the comparison of the share of intra-regional trade and cross-border investment among African countries, or even among regional economic groupings, and we compare this to what obtains in Europe, in America, or in Asia, we are lagging behind. So we need to accelerate the process of regional integration and regional uh, cooperation. And to do that, we need to invest in regional infrastructure. We need to bring down trade barriers, especially non-tariff trade barriers, and so that we can create a conducive environment for more trade and more investment among countries in Africa, yeah. especially among countries that constitute the key uh, economic groupings in Africa, whether it's SADC and whether it's COMESA. Yeah. Mauritius has always been a great believer in regional integration and regional cooperation. Yeah. So apart from uh, spending your time talking at conferences and these other kind of things, what uh, occupies your, most of your time now? I am the chairman of a leading company that operates in global business. As you're aware, uh, Mauritius uh, is promoting itself as a gateway between Asia and Africa and also between Africa uh, and, and, and Asia. We have developed a very uh, resilient broad-based and diversified economy. And global business is a key driver of economic growth in my country. So I'm looking after strategy, diversification, and development for a leading uh, global business company in Mauritius. Yeah, now in terms of where you sit and what you're seeing and the work that you are doing, that position of Mauritius is a bridge between Africa and the rest of the world, and Asia, if you like, particularly. Do you see the numbers beginning to support the case that Asia indeed is becoming Africa's largest trading partner and may well become the biggest in the future. For some countries, China uh, is already the leading uh, trading partner, whether sure. it is in import or in terms of export. Are they coming and, through Mauritius? And also in terms of uh, foreign direct investment. No, yeah. some of them are coming through uh, Mauritius because it's convenient, it's practical, and it makes sense you know, for uh, many organizations to structure uh, their business out of Mauritius because it's safe, it's secure, it's cost competitive, it's efficient. But the, the, the great advantage that I see for Africa is that the sources of foreign direct investment is becoming more diversified. Right. We used to rely exclusively you know, on OECD and in the industrialized countries. And many of these investments used to come only on mineral and resources. Now, the source is more diversified and the sectors in which these investments are taking place is also more diversified in manufacturing, infrastructure, telecommunication, uh, tourism. And this is important to bring about more linkages between these foreign direct investment and the local economy in Africa in terms of employment, in terms of outsourcing for small and medium enterprises, and in terms of the community itself, you know, being uh, uh, given 
some opportunities to benefit from this foreign direct investment. Yeah. Now, the position you occupy in a private company, of course, I suppose, gives you more room to see the private engagement that the outside world is having in Africa. And because of the China's nature, uh, chi because of the nature of China's relation with Africa, more on a government-to-government -government business basis, would you say that the evidence is beginning to come more and show more that India is, in fact, becoming uh, more engaged with Africa at the private sector level? I think both of them have got an important role to play. Because if you look at the missing link in Africa, we need to invest massively in infrastructure. Right. Whether this is energy and uh, water and sanitation, transportation, uh, information technology or communication. So in some areas, it's going to be the responsibility of government. Sure. And this is where the Chinese come in, you know, on a government-to-government -government basis to invest in infrastructure. But there are also opportunities from the private sector in India to invest in mining, in infrastructure, mm -hmm. in tourism, in telecommunication. Are these in the areas services. that you are seeing where that intervention coming in? I think so. And it makes sense also for uh, Africa to revisit the model where there is heavy reliance on only one product or one commodity. The strategy in the long term is basically to have high quality of growth, to diversify the economic base, yeah. to have more employment given to people so that we can address the problem of poverty and also uh, we can increase the, the, the living standard of our people. Yeah, so we are beginning to see the world becoming more interested in Africa now. So I suppose it's key how Africa positions itself. What's your take on how Africa is opening up to the world. Are we doing the right things right? Are there areas that we ought to be looking at that we are not looking at now that we should do so? There's been a marked improvement over the last 10 years in terms of macroeconomic stability, in terms of uh, the ease of doing business, in terms of basically the structural reform, the policy responses and many of these changes that have taken place in Africa. And this is evidenced by the fact that growth in Africa has been quite high. And we have been able to mitigate the adverse impact of the recession. But we started from a very low base. So we need to catch up. And to catch up, we need a growth rate that is sub substantially higher than what it is today. So investment in infrastructure, investment in education, investment in health. We need to continue to improve the business environment and the investment climate so that Africa gets a much higher share of foreign direct investment that we are getting today. Today I think it's about 4.5%. If you look at the potential that exists in Africa, we should get significantly higher foreign direct investment and higher portfolio investment in Africa than we are currently ha uh, having. Yeah. Now, one of the issues that's raised by foreign investors when they talk about Africa is its weak institutions and also policy-making capacity. Are there areas that Africa should be trying to engage in, in with uh, outside institutions? I mean, you worked for, for, for uh, the World Bank uh, as well as uh, the, the African Development Bank. What should Africa be doing to try to strengthen those areas? Are they a big issue in terms of trying to set its Afri Africa itself as an investment destination? You see, I mean, to be fair, yeah. when we speak about Africa, it's not homogeneous. 54 We're countries. We're talking about 54 <laughs> now, you know, with, with South Sudan. So there are some countries that have done exceptionally well, you know, in terms of economic governance and in terms of political governance. There are some countries, you know, that are emerging, you know, from a crisis that is in a post-conflict that are fragile, where I think the international institution need to support them in terms of governance and in terms of state capability. And there are some countries that are landlocked that requires a lot of support, you know, from the neighboring countries. And I think another area also where we probably have to work harder is to accelerate the process of regional integration. There are some countries where the size is so small, there's no scope. And it's very difficult, you know, to compete. So the solution is to have a much larger market so that it's possible for you to compete on a global level. Because we all know that the days of preferences are numbered. So you need to build uh, economies that can compete on a global basis. And if we have many small economies, it's going to be extremely difficult to do that. Yeah. So that's why we need also to harmonize some of our regional economic groupings because there are some duplication and, and uh, it doesn't make sense you know, to, to, to duplicate effort resources. 
So I think we need to do some co coordination there. And we need to do some homework in order to make sure that we're investing in the right sector so that we can maximize employment creation in order to meet the challenges of the MDGs. Yeah. Now, of course, the question that keeps coming back is the willingness of the politicians to implement the necessary changes. You raised a number of uh, areas where African politicians ought to be looking at. Is the political will there to streamline those organizations so we've got more regional integration, which necessitates a loss of sovereignty, if you like? Look, the political will is there. Is it? I think what is missing is how do you translate talk into concrete actionable plan to deliver on what has been promised. Now, there are many initiatives, for instance, you know, on financing regional infrastructure. Sure. So it's just a question, you know, how we translate these good words yeah. into concrete action. Yeah. And I believe that one way forward is we need to engage private sector either on a PPP basis or in some sort of partnership in order to invest in infrastructure, to invest you know, in the other areas where we think we can build competitive advantage. Yeah. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, uh, Africa is not one country. There are areas where there are weaknesses, yeah. and I don't have to mention these countries. Yeah, sure. But I think it is a responsibility you know, of all Africa and also our partners from abroad to help these countries yeah. you know, to have system in place, institution in place that will ensure that there is both political governance yeah. and economic governance and accountability. Yeah, but the difficulty of course is that, I mean, we're talking about 54 African countries now, <laughs> South Sudan having become independent uh, uh, on the 9th of July. So we're actually getting an increase in the number of countries when we're talking about integration. And then also in addition to that, we've got a multiplicity of organizations that all talk regional integration. How do you solve it? It is possible to accelerate regional reintegration, you know, on some specific geographic basis. Right. And in my humble submission, this is viable geography. This is viable geometry. There are some countries that are probably riper than others in order to accelerate that process. For instance, you know, Eastern Africa. It's possible for them, you know, to move the process, you know, much faster sure. than probably Comesa uh, and SADC. There are some areas. There are some other institutions probably where it, is, where it is weaker. But we have no choice than to accelerate this process of regional integration. But I think what is required is some flexibility in implementing these uh, regional integration initiatives so that the one that can move faster is not disadvantaged by the slow movers. So you need to create some sort of a viable geometry, like it has happened, you know, in other uh, in other countries, you know, where they have gone for regional integration and regional cooperation. So that at the end of the day, you can harmonize uh, your your market, and you can benefit, you know, from the economies of scale and from the economies of scope. Indeed, we're talking to Dr. Rama Sitan, and he is a former Deputy Prime Minister of Mauritius and former Finance Minister of Mauritius. When we come back, we talk about where he started and what he has done and what hopefully he's going to do in the future.